Hello everyone and welcome. We're talking today about the new Global Screen Fund, launched by the British Film Institute and the Department of Digital, Culture, Media and Sport in April, with the aim of boosting global exports of UK screen content. The fund, which is a £7 million one-year pilot at this stage, is a new source of international distribution, business development and co-production funding for UK companies in the film, TV, documentary, animation and interactive sectors. We are thrilled to be joined today by Neil Peplow, Director of Industry and International at the British Film Institute, who's, who is overseeing the fund and to whom the fund head, when appointed, will report. Neil is going to talk in detail for the first time about how the fund will work in practice and how to apply and what success will look like at the end of the first pilot year. With Neil are three industry practitioners with plenty of international experience and know-how. They're going to talk a little about the value to their businesses of co-production and collaboration, distribution and exports and developing independent companies. But first, over to Neil. <laughs> I didn't mean for you to see that. Oh my God. I'd like to know the truth. Do you think I could have tea with you? What's going on in here? Uh, so this fund was set up um, very close uh, collaboration with the DCMS um, from February of last year when we uh, uh, learned that we were not going to continue being part of um, Creative Europe and we uh, put together a business plan which was presented to Treasury in November. Um, Treasury was incredibly um, pressed at that point because the budget was focused on COVID recovery and the COVID crisis that the government in general was dealing with. Um, and to get £7 million for a pilot year was an incredible win um, for the sector and actually testament to the support that the Secretary of State has provided for the sector. So, uh, and I think that's kind of been demonstrated over the last year, for instance, with the restart scheme that has been put in place. So um, with the £7 million pilot, we then brought in a strategic advisory group. Uh, we brought in uh, industry uh, practitioners, uh, producers, sales agents, distributors, um, and also uh, representatives from the nations and regions, as well as uh, trade bodies. And we worked on how best to spend what will turn out to be between five and five and a half million uh, for uh, application between what we landed, where we landed, which was three uh, strands of funding. So uh, as I don't want to kind of take up too much time, I'll do a very brief summary of where we're at. The first to launch was um, international distribution. Um, and that's going to support UK sales agents to increase international promotional activity and sales of UK feature films. Um, sales companies can apply for a grant of up to £60,000 for a single eligible package film or up to 10000 for a single eligible pre-sale film. Um, and they, that opened on the 28th of April and it will close on the 30th of June. Um, the next strand, uh, which will open on the 25th of May, will provide financial support for business strategies that drive international growth. So that could be about IP development for companies, or it could be around distribution strategies, and that will cover companies working over film, TV, animation, doc, drama and documentary, as well as interactive narrative gaming. So um, you can apply for between 50,000 and 200,000 across a three year period for that. Um, and that fund will close on the 16th of July. Um, and then finally, uh, on the 15th of June, we'll have international co-production open, and that's going to support UK co-producers to join international co-production projects that have got strong export and international distribution potential. Uh, the strand is going to be open to UK producers of independent minority film and uh, majority and minority television works in animation or documentary, uh, and that's going to be encouraging uh, more international partnership. 
Um, so as this is coming out of Treasury, uh, the kind of measurements of success that we're looking at are going to be around uh, increased international revenue streams, increased collaboration, uh, increased numbers of productions, um, and also uh, the uh, reach in terms of audience. So can we uh, get more UK content seen by more people internationally? Um, it's kind of vital that we've had this fund in place to sustain the relationships. We've got very strong relationships that we've got with the EU, which uh, makes up around 40% of our total export market. But it's also a chance to explore uh, new territories and uh, work out how we can use some of the co-production uh, treaties that are currently in place, for instance, with India, Brazil uh, and China, but also explore new potential partnerships uh, further down the line. Um, and we have to support that uh, promotional campaign uh, fund, which is actually about um, branding the UK screen sector content, uh, talent and also businesses uh, in a way which is under a, an, an umbrella brand so that at key markets or festivals, um, we can bring together a narrative which will hopefully um, push uh, an awareness both with buyers but also audiences internationally so we we're looking at a model similar to uni france um uh, obviously uh to to, to develop a, a brand which would have a, a joined up narrative so that's something else which we are currently working on which we will probably uh, be able to launch in october um, and then finally we've been doing a piece of research around data um, one of the, the kind of key feedbacks that we got back from industry was that um, there was less and less access to relevant data to help with uh, making decisions about packaging or uh, distribution campaigns, um, especially during COVID where there have been no box office results to have a look at. So we've been, a uh, piece of research is, is happening now. We've got a survey out actually to, to ask industry what data would they like to have. Um, and I'll show you some uh, some uh, data that we got from uh, Parrot Analytics uh, last year when we kind of started to investigate this. Um, and I've got a slideshow, a very brief slideshow, to show the kind of um, data which, which could help inform uh, decisions around production. So this was done for us um, of July last year. And uh, Parrot uh, has a platform which tracks uh, digital data points. Um, and from those digital data points, it then looks at uh, the popularity of content and also talent. Um, and they have a ranking called travelability. So the level of demand for a particular show uh, and its benchmarks against its home market. Um, what they found was that uh, the UK is second only in the US uh, in terms of its ability to engage audiences around the, the planet. Um, and you can actually then dig into the data a bit more and have a look at where British content travels the best. And obviously the United States is an incredibly important market. Uh, then Australia, the Netherlands, but there's, for instance, a, a high level of demand in Russia, which um, I had previously hadn't necessarily been aware of. And it's this kind of data which could then potentially open up conversations in terms of finance packaging. And also you can then dig into the types of genre which are popular, most popular in what countries. Um, so that's something which we are currently exploring. And this slide, which you'll never see, is actually by individual title. Um, so uh, you can see Peaky Blinders is incredibly popular uh, internationally. And um, I'm not going to dig into any more detail on that. But you can start to see that actually there is data out there, which if you could access, you could then have a better understanding of potentially if you packaged it with a particular um, actor, it might have a greater demand in a particular territory which then could allow you to do a pre-sale in that territory. So um, those that's the kind of overarching ambitions of the Strand, but there's also uh, a desire to ensure that this reaches uh, the nations and regions and uh, to promote them uh, in terms of the great work that they're, that, that's happening with, within the nations and regions in terms of talent and, and companies, um, but also ensuring that the fund uh, help support uh, the, the amb their ambitions. Um, and to do that, we're looking at um, bringing together uh, the kind of production community across the UK to learn from each other, but also uh, from international expertise. Uh, so we're uh, looking at developing a, a, a UK a Global Screen Fund Summit uh, later this year, where we can start to, to, to do that. Um, and I, through this, I think we, we kind of understood that UK content was incredibly popular and also exportable um, and that we have a great history of working internationally and co-production has been a, a large part of that. But we've also 
um, found out things which we're looking at in terms of um, you know, how could we reduce barriers to doing uh, international uh, productions? Are there any barriers with the co-production uh, treaties or um, the way that we potentially um, could support uh, international networking? So there's a, a lot of work that's gone into the development of this fund. And we recognize that there's still a lot of work to be done as we learn more as we go. Um, and uh, at the moment, uh, for instance, we're still developing, the, finalizing the guidelines for the international business development and also the international co-production. Um, and still, uh, even when they launch, we'll learn from the data that we get in, in terms of if they need any adjustment um, and also whether or not we should be waiting the funding in any particular area. So that's currently where we're at. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Neil. Um, and sorry for the technical problems at the start of that. Um, I'll just jump in here to introduce our other speakers. Oh, actually, firstly, may I ask, will those data slides be available anyway, Neil, for if people want to dig into them and go through yeah, all those dots? So, so that we, we will make them available. We're, we're looking at doing um, releasing other data that we've gathered in terms of international box office. So that will be part of, as I say, the kind of the knowledge sharing that, that this will um, allow. Thank you. Um, so let me introduce our other speakers at this stage, because as Neil says, it's very important that as much feedback from industry is garnered as possible at this point. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I mean, everybody is here to talk about, you know, their international experience and know-how, and they're going to talk a little bit to us about the value to their businesses of co-production and collaboration, distribution and exports and developing independent companies in this context. Um, first, let me introduce Elizabeth Carlson, who is a producer and the co-founder of London-based Number no. 9 Films. She has many credits to her name, with some of the most recent being the Oscar-nominated Carol, directed by the renowned American filmmaker Todd Haynes, and Colette, starring Kira Knightley, both co-productions with Number no. 9's frequent collaborator, Christine Vachon's New York-based Killer Films. Elizabeth's most recent completed feature is Mothering Sunday, an adaptation of Graham Swift's post-World War I novella set post-World War I, directed by rising French filmmaker Eva Husson. Um, and we are also thrilled to be joined by Gronje McGuinness, who is creative director and co-founder of Northern Ireland's Paper Owl Films, which creates content for both children and adults across different platforms. The company has enjoyed immense international success with Pablo, which is one of the first children's TV programs to explore autism using a writing team and voice cast who are all on the autism spectrum. Pablo, which is comprised of over 50 episodes so far, I believe, has sold widely around the world and been a huge hit in Latin America in particular. And uh, thirdly, Bennett McGee joins us and he is the producer of the BAFTA nominated Mogul Mowgli starring Riz Ahmed. Last September, Bennett launched the home team production outfit with his friend Dominic Buchanan to showcase underrepresented voices. Together, they are developing a slate of features and high-end TV content for both VOD and the cinema. They're working with film directors including Shola Ramu and Destiny Akaraga, Daniel Ward, Omar El Kari and Nadia Latif, and with Rohan Blair Manga on a documentary series and also a TV project with director Kate Heron. Um, so let me ask um first perhaps elizabeth going to you first where do you see the opportunities and the challenges as a producer creating uk content today um just a small question <laughs> i'd say the biggest challenge is always you know just finding the material really finding the right material and bringing together the right collaborative team and that has become increasingly challenging as the demand for content with the proliferation of platforms um, and content providers, it means that, you know, a lot of talent are busy and there's a lot of stuff going on. And so I think it's just the challenge to, to find those people and also just to find space in a very crowded market. You know, how do you make those distinctive voices shine and how do you get them out there? I think. But, you know, the contrary to that is to say there's never been a better time because there's so many places to tell your stories. So there's always a plus side, you know, of, of what may be perceived to be a downside. And I think that's what you have to focus on as an independent. Thank you. And 
Gornia, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about Paper Owl and about where, where you see the opportunities and the challenges right now. Yeah, well, um, Paper Owl Films, we set up the company nine years ago um, to be free to follow our heart with projects. And I think the timing is really nice for what we do right now. So we want to create meaningful content for kids that will cut through in a very busy, noisy international marketplace, just like Elizabeth said, you know, um, finding the gaps for what children need in our space is, you know, it's, it's an ever, always a problem, but also to try and give unique expression within that space and find original voices and original ways of telling stories. And it feels like it's a really good time now. I think we're going to have a roaring 20s. I think creativity is going to explode. And I love the feeling right now that we're so much more open to hearing from new voices and diverse voices. You know, we're part of a really wonderful Celtic region um, in these islands, and we're sitting on a wealth of stories, and um, they stretch back so far, and they permeate through so much storytelling in the Western world, but they're really essentially Celtic, and that's what we're very passionate about getting out into the world right now. Um, but as a small region, um, it's very important that we grow talent here and that we allow, um, you know, voices to have expression from here. But then to be able to do that, it's great to be able to stand on the shoulders of international giants and bring in top line talent so that we can grow our own um, from the ground up. You know, we're very lucky here in Northern Ireland. We have always had a local screen funding agency with Northern Ireland Screen, and they set out a strategy years ago. I think they're actually on their fourth strategy now. Um, and they lay down the gauntlet of attracting international co-production and building the animation industry. And, you know, it's amazing what you can achieve when you actually make up your mind to go out there and get it. Yeah. So thank as paper you. Also, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I didn't no, tell I was you gonna say you... please sorry. go ahead. No, that that's probably enough. Just that we are along with a lot of other great companies in Northern Ireland just punching above our weight in the animation space in the world and that's what we just need to continue to strive to do. Thank you. I, I, I was just going to hand over to Bennett and hoping that he replicates your optimism and sense of the future. Bennett, can you tell us a little bit about your new company? Yeah, I mean, um, so, so yeah, I, I set up Home Team last September. I mean, it was, it was a little while in the making, maybe, a, you know, kind of a year before with my friend Dominic Buchanan who also happens to be an incredibly successful uh, film and TV producer. Um, and yeah, they, you know, this is Dominic and I have known each other for, for a very long time. We both grew up in, um, in film together. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we come from a filmmaking and film producing background, having worked for companies and then also as independent producers individually before coming together. And we, we had the benefit of having all of those years to have very, open, uh, frank, conspiratorial conversations with each other about our hopes, dreams, ambitions, um, <clears throat> you know, like what we wanted to do um, and, and how to achieve that. And we were always, you know, trying to to, to help each other out and to, to also be there when, you know, like through the hard times. So actually the opportunity to, to, to make home team, to, to, to start a company together um, that was a very easy conversation, despite the fact that we'd never had it. It was a very easy conversation because we'd had all of this history. So, you know, what 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 Home Team is 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 a company that is trying to fulfil a lot of what we've tried to achieve as as producers and as as content makers. Um, you know, it's it's a film and TV company that is primarily set up to promote, you know, filmmakers of colour and and female filmmakers. Um, not exclusively, but that's definitely an area of, of emphasis for us. 
um, and and to tell these stories. And and there's a little bit of what Garanya said in in what we're trying to to achieve is in you know there's a wealth of 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 history and perspectives that don't get the airtime that these stories deserves. And um, and so we're, we're we're trying to bring those stories you know both to UK audiences and to the world. And I think the the fund. Um, does represent you know kind of a continuation of some things that existed you know so the the europe media if that's what i can't remember what it's called now but if that's the the program that did exist that you know we're, we're kind of no longer putting money into you know i've i've been uh, i worked for a company who who had the benefit of that and i know that you know as producers you're, you're looking for as many opportunities as possible and um you know uh Grania and liz are incredibly smart people who probably don't need to make lists of one to 100 ways to do stuff and you know can probably get there quickly but uh you know like there's there's a part of of looking at it which is you'd never want to run out of options and so this is another option that we can use when some of the places that we might go to um you know don't give us what we want um so yeah like i think i think it's tremendously exciting i think there are you know we at home team are trying to tell stories on a an ambitious scale and we're trying to we're trying to we're trying to, to we're trying to give a platform to the filmmakers that we've worked with and, and will work with, but on a bigger scale. Um, and you know, like as as Liz was was saying, the competition is 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 quite fierce. You know, not just in terms of the crews and everyone, but you know, particularly in TV, you know, writers are tied up for so long. You know, you have to you have to look at different ways of putting things together. And so, you know part of, of, of this fund is going to allow us to, you know, just, just to have another, um, uh, another weapon in the arsenal, if that's the expression, maybe not, maybe not such a violent one. I should go for next time, but yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, I, I think, I think it's, you know, like there are challenges that come along, like, like the pandemic that we've lived, we've just, you know, lived through and continue to live through, can't expect. And then we know the, 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 the nature of film and TV changes. You know, you only have to look five years ago and look at how TV is as completely, and streamers have completely changed the, the landscape and, you know, who we're now, you know, directing our conversations to and stuff. And then there are, there are you know, institutes that are, are, are older than anything, older than all of us put together that will that will remain. So there are, there are always going to be challenges that are always going to hopefully be you know, similar ways of doing stuff. And then hopefully there'll be new ways of doing stuff and, and, and new funds to support that. So I'm optimistic Thank overall. <laughs> you are. Um, if I may put you on the spot a little, what is it about UK storytelling and content that you think does resonate in an international market and with international audiences? Bennett, if we may start with you. You're asking me, sorry. Um, it's, it's, so, so from a, a personal point of view, I think that, you know, like having grown up in, 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 in London specifically, but, you know, the kind of, you know, like traveled and, and been in a few other places, I was actually born outside of London, but, um, from what I see, there's just so many stories, you know, like this is, this is one of the most multicultural societies on the planet. Um, and, uh, and, and also has like a, such a rich history that isn't just about this particular island you know like it, it, it you know there, there are centuries centuries yeah centuries of history approaching centuries um uh of, of history that have touched all continents of this planet we live on and so there are so many ways in which you know um british stories mean so much more than you know what we might assume or perceive them to be and so for me there's just you know, like it, it's always going to keep giving. There's always going to be new experiences. And, and as we continue to um, uh, evolve as a society and as we continue to, um, you know, be more multicultural as, a, you know, from generation to generation and, uh, and everything, there is going to be fresh perspectives and, and fresh stories to be told. There's also such a huge, rich history that hasn't been told that is, 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 is very British. Um, and so, from my point of view, you know, kind of, uh, and, 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 and from everyone at home team, we're really excited to kind of, you know, that there's no end to the stories. The thing we have to stop ourselves doing is, is saying yes too often because, you know, we don't have the capacity to just keep, uh, you know, like to tell everyone's, everyone's story, but, um, but yeah, but yeah, there's, there's, yeah, it, it's so rich. There's so much that hasn't been 
put on the screen and said in so many ways that um, for me, that's the opportunity. That's the exciting thing to get into. Thank you. Gronje, you've had amazing success with Pablo. Why do you think it resonated so much in Latin America in particular? Well, it's it has a, it's sold all around the world. Um, and I think the moment was just right. The whole the whole thinking behind Pablo is about appreciating different ways of experiencing the world. Um, and it find a way to do that in a really fun and funny way. Um, it also takes a way into story through the autistic experience um, that is unique, you know, especially in the world of kids content. We've made two series of Pablo now. That's 104 stories to find based on the preschool experience. <laughs> and the preschool content map is jammers with great stories already. So actually by giving voice to um, the autistic perspective in a way that hadn't been done before, we opened up writing that was really quirky and original. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why, why it resonates in one country or another particularly well, um, but I know that it does resonate throughout the world from Australia to America to Canada and Europe. And I think our population is increasingly finding more autistic voices within it. And to me, it's it's kind of the next step in how we do things, how we, how we allow space for thinking differently and seeing the world in different ways. And when you do that, you open up a whole new batch of stories that you didn't think were there before. And if you bring a bit of crack to that as well and um, give the audience a laugh, then I suppose you're on to a winner. Thank you. Elizabeth, if I may turn to you now, um, your, your slate and your films are such a mixture of UK stories and UK talent with real international talent as well. Like your most recent film, Mothering Sunday, is jam-packed full of UK actors and a wonderful uh, UK writer in Alice Birch, but it's directed by Eva Husson. Could you talk a little bit and tell us a little bit about the importance of the international, having an international outlook to you? Yeah, I think, and also the film we're about to start shooting, Living, um, which is directed by Oliver Hermanas, who did the um, fantastic film Mothi that people might have seen on Curzon and Player, who's... Um, a South African filmmaker um, and written by Ishiguru, so who is, you know, Japanese brought up in the UK. I think it's just, it's something that Stephen and I have always done, perhaps because we were outsiders in different ways. Um, you know, my mother was English, my father was Norwegian, I was born in New York, then moved back to the UK and always had a sense of not really fitting in. And then you add that to gender where you know, women were completely underrepresented in our industry when I started, as they were in every walk of life other than the caring professions, and pretty much still are. So, and when I first started working, it was in queer independent cinema in the States, and then started working here for Palace, which is the company that Stephen and Nick Powell set up, which was doing work that was completely unexpected and, and revolutionary in cultural, creative and political ways. So Stephen and I have just always worked. I was looking at the most recent films, like Between Mother and Sunday and Finest and Carol and Colette. And, you know, I thought, OK, so we're working with South African, Danish, Hungarian, French, Australian. Um, I think, like Bennett was saying, is that, uh, you know, England is a multicultural country and the most successful throughout history places are multicultural, where there is a free movement of ideas. And I'm a great advocate of just as ideas move freely, people need to move freely. And, and that's where society um, can be most equitable when different voices are heard and, you know, economies are shared. And, and it's just something that we do in our work. And I think it's creatively and politically inspired. Thank you. 
looking forward to living. That sounds interesting as well. Um, we've had um, a few questions come in already, so I think we'll turn um, to them and ask. I think it will probably be you, Neil. And please do leave your any questions that you have in the chat box to the side. Um, so a question, Neil, somebody asked, is there any specific allocation of the fund plan between film, TV and animation to the nations and regions or to support diverse production? So, as I said, there's a kind of a requirement for flexibility in this because we don't yet know where the levels of demand will be. But there is a prioritization in the awards uh, towards uh, the nations and regions. So we're looking at um, where the applicant is based uh, and how the content or how the content reflects uh, the cultural or, and talent of Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland, Wales and the English regions outside of Greater London. So there is a prioritization, although not a, a ring fence allocation. And again, between film, TV and, and animation, we've not uh, ring fenced any money to each of those uh, subsectors um, because again we, we we need to be able to adapt and be flexible dependent on the applications that we get in uh, what we've set a kind of criteria which applies ac across the, the those those subsectors so that we can judge them uh, equally and we've been working closely with um, companies animation companies interactive games um, tv drama uh, and doco to, to ensure that we're open to those companies applying, but also that we're kind of judging them equally. Um, and in terms of diversity, all the applications will be required to uh, map against the uh, diversity standards of the, of the BFI. Thank you. Perhaps it's a good moment to ask how the fund fits in with the other BFI funds. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that, please? Um, so this is a separate and uh, run in very close collaboration by the DCMS uh, who have uh, sponsored the, the business proposal for Treasury. So there's a, a separate report that reports into the DCMS uh, and because it's Treasury money and it's not lottery money, uh, there are Treasury requirements in terms of the types of KPIs that we're required to uh, map against. So they're much more about the commercial impact in terms of additional revenue, or, or as I've said, the ability to reach uh, new audiences, work in new territories, um, and set up new collaborations and, and relationships. Um, so, so it's different from the lottery in that uh, it is much, it is much more commercial in its intent, uh, and therefore it, it doesn't have um, kind of an editorial uh, input into, uh, for instance, if you are developing a state of titles as part of the business development support. Uh, you, there, there won't be a kind of close collaboration on, on the development of those titles. Uh, it will be looking at the reporting back on uh, how many of those titles went into production and, and, and what was the additional revenue that was generated by them. Uh, and the same for, for instance, minority co-productions. Um, we're not going to be sitting in, a, you know, a fine cuts uh, to give notes. Um, it's going to be looking at purely does this open up new relationships and new territories uh, and what's the potential future impact of, of that on the business uh, in two to three years. Thank you. And you, your timeline is you're hoping to have a fund head in place within the next few months, is that? Uh, within, well, yes. I mean, we'll be able to hopefully make an announcement within the next couple of weeks. Okay, great. Um, and another question for you while, while we have you. Um, somebody in the audience says, thank you for listing the upcoming deadlines. Do you envisage that there'll be further deadlines announced later this year and how often do you anticipate to be an announcing funding rounds? Uh, so the intent is to, after we've launched these three rounds or these three funds, uh, is to have a pause and then to see how much money has been allocated, where the most demand is, and then we might find that actually we only go to a second round for uh, one or two of those strands. Um, but as I said, it's kind of a work in progress. It, this is a pilot year. So we're kind of exploring what that should look like and also what we need to gather in terms of the evidence to convince Treasury that this should be turned into a multi-year settlement. Um, and we, we also need to look at gaps that are potentially, uh, that have been missed out in this, this first uh, iteration of the, of the fund. Are there any areas that we haven't yet covered uh, that we potentially need to think about moving forward? Um, Creative Europe has obviously been around for decades and there are uh, 
they work at a scale and kind of with a with a built-in reciprocity which is uh, difficult to replicate so uh, we're having to find solutions to to work uh, at work out how we can get the same impact for uk businesses at the same kind of reach for uk content um, but but using the mechanisms that we we have available so um, the short answer is the intent is yes there will be a second round uh, but not quite sure uh, when thank you um have another question for you please um can you confirm the funding priorities for the international co-production part of the fund with respect to film uh, these are the because we've had a lot of feedback on these guidelines these are the ones that are in development at the moment so we've still got th kind of two or three weeks before we have to lock those down um, at the moment we're, we're we're kind of having a conversation around official co-productions versus unofficial co-productions uh, and also um, the requirement for British qualifying uh, so that, that these are questions which are very much live at the moment um, we are looking towards prioritizing uh co-productions with countries where we do have an official co-production treaty in place um, however at the same time we don't want to rule out exploring relationships with countries where we don't yet have a co-production treaty in place so um an example of that could be uh, for instance uh, nigeria who we're currently in conversation with about uh, developing a, a kind of memorandum of understanding with their equivalent of the bfi there to explore whether or not we should be uh, putting in place a co-production treaty and also the Department of International Trade are uh, holding a webinar, I think, next week uh, to encourage uh, networks of producers in Nigeria and the UK to start establishing relationships. Um, so we are looking at prioritising territories with official co-productions, but also we don't want to you know, miss a chance of giving a company the ability to actually establish a, a, a really positive uh, relationship with a territory where we don't have an official co-production. Thank you. I'm going to jump back to um, our producers on our panel now and ask you all if you can, I'm sure that we have some creatives in our audience. And can you talk a little bit about what you're looking for from writers from directors who are pitching projects with you to whom you're talking about projects if you're looking for sort of internationally content that will travel what are you looking for how do you position that to creatives perhaps Gronier, i'm not sure how exactly you work with new creatives but perhaps you could talk a little bit about that yeah so um our development process is about you know, thinking about what the gaps in the market for children are, and then coming up with ideas that meet that gap. Um, and we partner with distributors to take our work out into the uh, world. Um, so at home, what we're really good at, we're really good at finding stories and shaping stories and producing content. So what we need all the time, we are hungry for writers all the time. And we are hungry for storyboard artists. And we are also hungry to attract top level directors in, and people at that high end of the process as well, who can come in with an international perspective and experience and help us grow um, and help us find new expressions and also grow the talent at home. So if is there something that you, you, you wish you could say to writers? You, you, you'll pitch projects or people send you things and you're really trying to get something for a writer. Is there something that you would say to them? What's the sort of the X factor, the sort of the international perspective that, that you would like them to have? And is it possible to sort of articulate what that is? Yes. It is possible to articulate, but I think it's two answers, Louise. I think it's at one level, you're looking for experience, track record, someone that you know can do it and someone that your broadcasters and funders will 
be able to rely on as well. So that deliverability piece is is always key. Then the other piece that we always need as well is fresh new talent. So we always want, and that's something that I worry about a bit at the minute as well, you know, um, you know, young graduates in the last year getting opportunities, even for us as a company at the minute, we're all working remotely. We've managed really well to do that in animation. Um, probably been luckier than some of my colleagues on the panel. Um, but at the same time, we haven't had the opportunity to maybe nurture new talent coming up through in the way that we would always like, because it's that face to face piece um, uh, that means so much when you're trying to help somebody find their voice and tell a story, you know, and we had a great experience in doing that on 104 episodes of Pablo, because we find people who didn't think they were going to have the opportunity to find a voice and tell their stories and then they did so the excitement of that was amazing and when we looked in a different place for talent um well we found it in spades um, and the process of of seeing that spark and seeing that come alive was joyous but it was it was helped very much by a very experienced writing team coming in the other side so it's kind of the both ends i think uh -huh. Thank you. No, it sounds wonderful. Elizabeth, your, I mean, as we talked about before, your, your slate has always sort of seemed to mix UK talent with international talent. When, when you're developing a project, what is the X factor for you that gives it that international potential? Is it possible to <laughs> pinpoint that, to, to talk a little bit about that? Is it about making sort of very specific stories that yeah. you know are going to be universal? I do. I think that I'm such a subscriber to the laws of physics where movement creates a vacuum and you know everyone's running in one direction saying what does the market want and what do people want to see and invariably you know it is the dark horse that no one sees coming and I think it's what makes for so many of us this business so addictive is you know the William Goldman maxim of no one knows anything and I just find the endless stories about the films which were turned down by every financier and every distributor and every film festival, even when they were completed. I mean, there are so, so many of them and, you know, they go on to become some of the greatest independent films that we've seen. I mean, going way back and starting with Bresson and, you know, going all the way through to Lives of Others and, and you know, numerous, numerous, untold numerous films. and. The ones that have been often hardest for us to get made have been the ones that have gone on to be the most successful and you know some films that you're seeing like books that are being picked up now are films that you're seeing made that never would have stood a chance i mean i know when andrea levy talked about next on a small island and just saying it was just impossible every door was closed to her and you know, someone has the foresight of while everyone else is thinking, everyone's reading this, we need more of this. Someone goes, oh, Andrea Levy's Small Island, that's what we should publish. You know, that's what we should put on TV or that's what. And so I, I think that, you know, I think if you try and chase what you think might work or you apply some kind of algorithm or Venn diagram, you're going to kind of come unstuck because undoubtedly, as Granny was saying, you know, you look somewhere else for the talent and I don't know, there's just, it's hard to say particularly what we look for. I mean, something just appeals and something just grabs us and, and we run with it and you just don't always know what it's going to end up. And, you know, like when Mothering Sunday came along, on the one hand, it's a, it's a period story, it's set in just after the end of World War II, but what's so fascinating is it's a story about the unintended consequence of something so horrific as the war and loss, and from that space, with the collapse of structures around gender and class and economy, rises up this girl who's been in service since the age of 14, who becomes this phenomenal writer. And that was the unintended consequence of one of the most horrific moments in history. And when Alice Birch came to write it, I thought that was such a brilliant combination. And then seeing Eva Husson's work, the idea of bringing the kind of sensuality and texture that she brings to her work and the irreverence into the mix. And you think it will produce something, but you just 
don't know. You know, you're always sort of trying to to push the boundaries and and put new things together. And similarly with Stephen and living, and I, I think that's just we've tried to do. And and sometimes it will work better than others. And but we, you know, you just keep a lot of it's just getting out of bed in the morning, really. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Very much so. Um, and it, with your new company, your 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 stated aim is to work with UK talent. How much of a focus on them producing international content is important for you, or, or are you you just do you not think like this at an early stage? You're just looking for good work, and if it travels, that's great. Or do you are you thinking this early on, or, or very early on? about working with content that will travel internationally? Yeah, I think I think we're, we're always thinking about, you know, always thinking strategically. So we're always thinking, how do you get something made? How do you, like, who can, you know, if, it, if it's TV or film, like, who are you selling this into and who would be the greatest partner? And, you know, like, you know, even thinking about the end, you know, who's the distributor that you're going to work with, you know, internationally, invariably, you sort of concentrate on the UK and US, of course, but, you know, um, we're trying to think beyond that as well. I think, I think a lot of, you know, what Liz and Grania have said is in, it's, it's, I, th I think if we had like the best, most articulate answer, we would be giving it, like everyone would just go off and say this is what I want and then you know we'd no longer be in the business we're in because actually you 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 rely so much on what your engagement and reaction to material is you know, uh, you know we, we've all we, we can all appreciate films there's there some fantastic films out there that I've seen that if they'd sent me the script I would have either missed it or not developed it right I would have you know like been the worst person for it so I think you have to also put yourself into the position of the material that you're um, being sent. And I think, I think for us, um, and, 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 you know, for me personally, over the years, what I've, what I think I've honed in on is, is kind of, um, I, I, I like new experiences. So, you know, kind of, we all, there, there are some, you know, uh, restaurants we're probably all dying to go back to and the one particular dish that you want and that you will just keep returning to because it's so good and it's always done right. But you also want the other experience. You also want some, you just want someone to go, I don't even want to tell you what I like. I just want you to go into the kitchen, conjure something up. Maybe I'll give you a sense of the ingredients I like and come out and give me a new dish. And you taste it and you either go, what is this? <laughs> Maybe I should have been more prescriptive. Or you would, you love it and then you share it with your friends and you share it with the world and all of a sudden there's this new dish that's been created. And I think that's it. It's like, you, you just want, you know, I would say to new, to, to new writers, just give me a new experience, like give me something that isn't necessarily, like they don't have to reinvent the wheel, like it could be you take a genre and you subvert it or you do something that hasn't been done within it, or or you just give you, you just so, someone that tells a story that is um, their experience and, and that actually hasn't really been shared on screen very much, you know, as long as that experience is kind of written in, a, in an informed or authentic or, or, or way that comes from the heart and you know that those characters are believable or real or or maybe so heightened that they're, they're, they're that much fun you know there's got to be something that that draws you in but i think it's got to come from a place of of of, of newness and i don't mean originality so much because because i think you know sometimes people will sell you an idea or a concept and you can go this is great but actually what is really underneath that isn't so great and it's you know like I, i'm sure we've all had those conversations where you want to tell someone i'm not excited by your idea but your idea is brilliant and it's like how do you you know what does that even mean and i think i think it's because underneath it they haven't you know like grabbed you in a way that's like really really giving it to you so um yeah you can see i'm grappling with this i don't know the answer to your question but all, all we can say <laughs> no it was a I, tough I like one i can speak collectively is, is that we just you just respond to stuff and I think most of the, the response is because there's a there's a truth within the work and that that can be some you know like fantasy sci-fi project or it can be some incredibly grounded based on a real story drama but whatever it is I, I think I think it, so a sense of truth and, and and newness for me anyway is is, is always appealing and, and that I would hope to be sent more of would it be correct to say 
precisely the, the writer shouldn't overthink things. Don't don't write a piece of work they hope is going to appeal to Japanese audiences or to German audiences. It's it's just about the work or the subject. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd say so. I mean, I, I'd, I'd, I'd try not to be too prescriptive because there's you know, many reasons that people might want to do something for a particular market. But I think, you know, like, yeah, I think it's really, I, I would, I think so. Um, I think it's really difficult to kind of go, I know what's going to work in a certain territory, therefore I'm going to write it. Like, I think you have to write from a, a much more, um, uh, like almost selfish place, if that's the word, like you have to write from a place that's like, this is true to me. This excites mm -hmm. me. Hopefully you find a connection with someone else. And then you start to build that way. You know, like, I think, uh, you know, Liz's point about, um, those films that are the sometimes hardest to make and um the the films that everyone has passed on you know there's so many amazing stories about those um i hope to have one myself one day you know i <laughs> hope to pass in some great material um you know the the what that tells you is that someone connected with the material and this just goes back to whatever so you know to, to what i was saying at the beginning is in you have to put as a producer you have to put yourself in the mix and say yes i get this i respond to this i know the people i'm going to call and you know like hopefully over time you build up a sense of you know institutes or a sense of individuals that work at these places and and you go i know that there's going to be other people in the world that will connect with this and and i guess that 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 idea that you know if you have if, if you read something and you go oh my god everyone's going to love it you might give yourself a sense of scale or if you think do you know what there are a couple of people that are going to love this the rest of the world's not and that might that might say that might mean you make a slightly smaller scale movie but it's still going to be a, a work of art and a thing of beauty that that could have its own bigger life so you know you kind of make that that call but um yeah i've, I've just answered the, the the previous question again i'm sorry i haven't like addressed that but no I, that's I don't perfect think writer, thank I think you should write from a more personal like because they're uh, uh, heartful mm. place rather than I, I trying love, to second guess you know what i loved i watched the dear your derbyshire documentary on bbc radio 4 mm. yesterday and i thought there's a, a story about verity lambert getting into the bbc radiophonic workshop which was a kind of you know small room with old equipment and eccentric people who weren't allowed to call themselves composers or create creators and verity lambert went in and said I need for no money something that doesn't sound like anything else for this show we're doing called Doctor Who. And, you know, Delia Derbyshire came up with a Doctor Who theme tune, which is the most extraordinary visionary piece of work that had she been credited for it and compensated for it, you know, there'd be a trust for her for all these people working electronic music that would have vast sums of money in it. But it was just that's such a creative act by producers to think, I'm going to go into a space that no one thinks of going into and speak to this woman who is completely eccentric and an absolute genius. And that song resonates across the world. And for me, that was a moment of genius producing, using a voice that hadn't been used. And how prophetic was it? I just thought that that kind of summed it up in a way for me. Thank you. <laughs> is it? Elizabeth, was that is that on BBC Four or Radio Four? So we can check it out. It was on BBC Four. Um, yeah, it's a pretty cool documentary, and I'd watch on the BFI player um, Sisters with Transistors, which was also really okay. interesting. In a way, it's sort of talking what we're talking about. It's people who were just so far ahead of their time, you know, and look at us now. I mean, it's the trouble with creative industries. Is hindsight is such a wonderful thing, isn't it? You know, it's when you you're in the moment, you go, yeah, of course, that's what everyone was looking for. But who even knew? I mean, now I think about, we've got this fantastic Niels Fram track on Mothering Sunday, and I just love the way it works. And I love that juxtaposition between a contemporary electronic track on a period movie, and then watching the Sisters with the Transistors and also Delia Derbyshire, you just think, I don't know, it just excites me again, just how wild and wonderful and unexpected this creative world we're in is mm. and how unknowable, really. Mm. When will we be able to see Mothering Sunday, do you think? Um, well, assuming that cinemas steam ahead with their yesterday's opening and there's a global rollout, it should be this autumn. Wonderful. Um, 
I've got a couple more questions for Neil um, from the audience, um, specifically about the fund, of course. Um, if a film is not set in the UK and is being shot abroad but qualifies as a British co-production or is being co-produced by UK producers, could it qualify for the fund? Uh, at this moment in time, yes, uh, it could. Uh, but again, we'd have to wait for the final and full guidelines to be um, signed off uh, just to confirm that. But yeah, if it's a minority co-production, uh, there's no English language requirement um, and it doesn't have to be set in the UK. There are a few requirements it does have to hit. Uh, but the, you know, the whole intent of the Minority Co-Production Fund is to open up new relationships and kind of cultural and commercial partnerships that can, as you kind of reflecting back on what's just been said, create those moments of creativity, which we wouldn't have been able to explore without this fund. Um, so uh, it's trying to be as flexible and as open as possible, uh, but still fitting within obviously the guidelines that we, we have to adhere to that have been given to us by, by Treasury. Thank you. So we are nearing the end of our time and we're going to run the trailer again at some point, but not just quite yet. Because I just wanted to check with Neil if, um, yeah. because we've had lots of questions and we've covered lots of subjects and I wanted to check with you before we wrap up, if there's anything finally that you would like to say or anything that we've missed that you'd like to highlight. Now, in terms of the fund, um... There, there is an email that I think has been posted in chat. So if you've got any further questions, please use that email um, to ask the team anything specific. Uh, and if you want to give us feedback or insight at this point, um, we are open to that. We want to make sure this fund really does work um, for the sectors that it's, it's there to support. Um, I just think this, this fund has the opportunity to help the independent sector uh, in, in a time which is incredibly busy, but also, you know, the independent sector is, is being squeezed by, by the new streamers who have come in, in terms of kind of, kind of the, the theatrical releases and the windows and, and the opportunities um, are changing. But I think what, what the opportunity that this fund offers is the ability to open up partnerships and conversations and, and to, to develop an, a new understanding or a greater understanding of what the UK brand is of content because um, although Paddington 2 has now replaced Orson Welles as the highest rated film on um, Rotten Tomatoes uh, and people do know Downton's Abbey and, and King's Speech, we've got this really creative, incredibly diverse uh, and rich storytelling tradition which gives us County Lines and Bait and Rocks and Mogul Mogul Mowgli and that's the, that's the, that's the alternative that we want to put in front of people internationally. We want to show them that we have a wide breadth of talent and stories that, that are being told. Um, and I think that's a really exciting opportunity that, that, that the um, Global Screen Fund uh, offers. Um, so watch this space and, and hopefully we'll be back uh, to report that Treasury have agreed to a, a multi-year settlement uh, with a slightly larger budget to reflect the ambition that, that we, we have for the fund. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Neil, and thank you very much to Bennett McGee of Home Team, to Elizabeth Carlson of Number Nine Films, and to Gronier McGuinness of Paper Owl Films in Belfast. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives and taking your time here with us today. Thank you, Neil, for explaining it all, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot more over the coming months about this. Um, thank you to the audience for listening to this panel at the Restart Conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Run VT.